and so if that's my day, unless I'm headed home, see my dogs. Well, we are so thankful to go to sleep, you know, take a nap. <laughs> All right, we're at that time, so we'll let Tom sit down real quick. Are you going to stay standing? And, uh, no, I'm on close door. All right, I'll let you close the door and then come sit back down. And then we'll open with a word of prayer. And then we'll let everybody else come in. <laughs> Mandarin time. It's Mandarin time. You're you're absolutely right. We will we will just try to start on time as close as we can and end on time as close as we can. Because you know everybody's okay starting late, but nobody's okay with them starting late late. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and open. Oh, oh, oh. We'll let another one sit down. And another one sit down. <laughs> Put the light on. Burn the <laughs> All right. Let's go. Father, we come before you humbly and say thank you, Father. We thank you that we can come together to assemble, to study some more of your word, Father, to worship you and to fellowship together as a family. Father, we thank you for your written word. We thank you that you've given it to us that we can study. Father, as we study, we ask that you grant us the wisdom to understand the word you've written to us, that you write your words on our hearts, and that you use your words to change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So this is a Hoban wood cut. And this is Jonah. <laughs> so this was a, it was a cut in the 16th century. Jehovah was a, this shall we say, in the 16th, 15th or 16th century, I can't remember. But if you think about an idea of a Bible, all right, they wanted to make a mass printing of something. This guy carved a whole bunch of pictures like this, and then they would actually get stamped into the Bible. So this is, is the Hoban woodcut for Jonah. We can see Jonah has, no, it's not historically accurate, by the way, because that wouldn't have been there in the time of Jonah. The idea of a book or a codex wasn't around until later in history. And they had a novel. So like, well, yeah, there's a whole lot. Like, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's always interesting when you see the, the adaptation. So if you go through and you look through artwork and that, that follows the Bible and all that, it, it's funny to see the different artists and their rendering of, of how they depict it. They always put their situation back in, okay? How they understand things. I.e., when you've got Paul, like there's a, I can't remember which one of the, 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 the famous painters did it now. But one of the one of the painters did a picture of Paul while he is in his first imprisonment in Rome. All right. And here's Paul sitting at this desk writing with a big, huge, long sword sitting next to him. And this is a prisoner. <laughs> I don't know that even in that day and Paul being as free as he was during that imprisonment would have had a big sword sitting next to him, you know. But Jonah, is he happy or sad? That picture, he's sad. sad. He's sad. How did Jonah walk out? I already started. How did Jonah start chapter four? How did he walk out of the city? Oh, I didn't name that part. All right, so, sorry, technical difficulties here. I didn't, I didn't move things over to the proper screen beforehand. So you're going to have to see all this stuff is supposed to be behind the curtain. See, the screen's too So this tablet over here, if you didn't know, there's a tablet sitting right here. That's actually working as a second monitor. So, all right. So Jonah chapter four. All right. We have already, we're actually at verse nine, but we're going to read just so we can keep the context because it's been a couple of weeks. Apologize. I had work last week. So, there was a break in continuity, and we're finishing up Jonah. So, all right, so starting in verse one, chapter four of Jonah, it says, But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew you were gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. 
The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under, sorry, I moved it, off the books, and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to become or to be shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm, and dawn, and when dawn came the next day and attacked the plant, it withered. The sun came up, and God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. We've already talked about all of that. Verse 9. Then God said to Jonah, you have good reason to be angry about the plant. And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, you have compassion on the plant. It did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand, their right and their left hand, as well as many animals? Wow, you want to talk about the biblical slap in the face? It's not quite as bad as God saying to Job, where were you when I? But Jonah was angry, angry when he saw the Ninevites repent. And as we talked about in chapter three, we're not going to go back and rehash that. But in chapter three, it says that Nineveh was such a great city. It should take three days to preach the message there. All right. Jonah went in one day and walked out. As it said, on the east side of the city. So let's pull this map up real quick. All right, so this is a map of Nineveh. Oh, by the way, this is an actual book. I should have showed you that to you. So this is the Rose Then and Now Bible Map Atlas. Oh, actually, I think we've been using a different one. I don't know what they were using that one. We were using this one, the Harper Collins Dictionary. It's actually, oh, no, we weren't. No, sorry. So, orientation for those of us who don't remember. All right, so here's north. Here would be east. Jerusalem, the water, all that is over there. Okay? This should just tell us that if Jonah walked in, spent one day, and came through to the east side. The idea here is that Jonah did not spend three days <clears throat> preaching. Jonah spent one. Chapter 3 tells us that the people heard the word, and then they started showing signs of repentance, okay? We're not going to go back into all that. But it is quite possible that Jonah saw their signs of repentance and was upset and said, enough of this, I'm out. Except he would have been a little more emphatic in the way he said that, because it said he is angry. Jonah did not want to do this. Jonah does not want them to repent. Jonah does not want God to stay the execution on Nineveh. Interesting. Then God said to Jonah, do you have reason to be angry? And Jonah says what? Good reason. I have good reason. What's that reason? Selfish. Okay. Isn't this the part we all go like, why didn't you kill us? Right? The Bible doesn't say why he's angry. It does not tell us why he's angry. 
This is one of those things that I wish, like in many other points, there would have just been a little bit further into the text. But why do you think Jonah was angry? Because he was selfish, okay? There is a thought that Jonah understands that the Assyrians were those who were going to come in and take out the northern tribes in about 30 to 40 years. We don't know that. We don't know, as we said, how long Jonah lived for. We don't know exactly when the events of Jonah took place. We have a time frame, Jeroboam II. All right, we have that time frame, and it could have occurred somewhere in that time frame, but we don't have the explicit to say, yes, that is it and when it was. So we can't really say that. So is that plausible that Jonah had some knowledge that God was going to use the Assyrians to exhort the punishment? As we've already shown, shown in Amos, who is a contemporary of Jonah, God sent Amos to the northern tribes of Israel. And one of the things he said in chapter six was, is, I am preparing a nation to take you out. That nation, historically, both in the Bible and external biblical references, say that was the nation of Assyria. Nineveh is in the nation of Assyria. At the time under which Nineveh takes over, I mean, Assyria takes over the 10 northern tribes and carries them off into captivity, never to come back. This is not the Babylonian captivity. That's the second captivity that happens. And they do come back from that. It's the Assyrians. And at that time, the Assyrians moved their capital to Nineveh. At the time of Jonah, it's still not there. But as we've seen before, that that is best to understand the king of Nineveh to be the king of Assyria. And as we've seen in 2 Kings already, it talks about the king of Israel being also the king of Samaria. There is no king of Samaria. Samaria was the city or was the capital of the 10 northern tribes of the nation of Israel, not the nation of Judah. All right. So the king of Samaria is used to reference the king of Israel. So we can already see that that same method has been used before. But Jonah's upset. He's angry, and we don't have it. Go ahead. There's another thought. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Syrians are Gentile. You know, Jonah, Jonah, and Jonah's a Jew. And uh, you may have a problem with that. You know, I think of uh, an example of that, I think the Apostle Peter, he had a problem with the Gentiles uh, for many years. You know, in the beginning, we see when he, comes, he uh, goes to Cornelius, and, uh, and he has that dream before that, you know, about things that are unclean, and we don't call that unclean, clean, clean, clean. And even after Cornelius and his band uh, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then he realized they need to get baptized to be saved. Now, 15 years later, the Apostle Paul, who knew him being Galatians, you know, uh, he notices that when, he, uh, when Peter's with the Gentiles, he's all right with the Christian Gentiles. And then when the Jewish Gentiles come and approach him, he separates himself from the, Gen from the Christian Gentiles. You're talking about the Jewish, you're talking about the Jewish Christians. Christians yes, Christians, yes. The men of James, I think so, is the way Galatians so puts it. That's the <laughs> and so Paul rebukes them on that. Yes. He tells them, he rebukes them, you know. And uh, you would think that Paul would have that attitude, being that he was a Christian killer before he became a Christian, you know. Right. And, uh, he, against, and, and, and he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews and the Pharisees of the Pharisees. He was a true blue Jew, you know. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have that attitude. And he was set aside for the Gentiles. But yet, Peter had that problem. And I, and I, I, and I imagine he might continue to have that problem until he dies. I think we all have certain things that... We need to deal with that. There is, there is that, that possibility in this. But as, but as I showed in the beginning, which you weren't here for all that, okay. there was like 27 different provisions in the law for the foreigner. For what? The foreigner. Oh, yes. yes. The non-Jew. So God is the God of all. I, I spent a couple of weeks laying that out. So is it possible? There is a school of thought who thinks the book of Jonah within modern scholarship and you know, when we say modern in, in scholarship, we're talking 50 years, okay? So it's not really modern in a lot of ways, how we would use it in other disciplines would consider modern. So you jump back at 100 years back, there are those who thought that the book of Jonah was written after the return, okay, 
from captivity. And at the same time frame of Nehemiah and Ezra and first and second Chronicles, I don't place it there. I place it before that. I place it during the Babylonian captivity and with first and second Kings, the writing of first and second Kings. And I've already laid out that argument. I don't want to waste our time going back through that. But those who believe that hold that Jonah's attitude was that of a rich and high nationalism that they read back into Ezra and Nehemiah, which I would caution us from doing, but we're not teaching Ezra and Nehemiah to do that. But is that possible? Yes. He didn't want it to be a serious. Here's where the text says that's a highly questionable proposition. What about the sailors? Jonah said, throw me over and your trouble goes away. If he didn't like the Gentile, we do that. So the overarching understanding that it's nationalist is not supported by the text itself. Does that make sense? So is it a possibility? Sure, but I think the text kind of says, ah, you probably should look somewhere else. And it's just a simple fact of it's the Ninevites. He had a problem with the Assyrians. The Assyrians are bad. We spent time, we've looked at a few pictures of this to show how bad the Assyrians are. They're a wicked and evil place. And we also looked at the map during the time of Jeroboam. We looked at where the Assyrians, and I know you got to go way back, seven, eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks, whatever it was, all the way back, we looked. So 2 Kings chapter uh, 14, I think it's verse 25, where we read about Jonah, he prophesies that God is going to give back that the Jeroboam II, the king at the time of this, is going to retake some of the lands of Israel and broaden it back out. Jonah's uh, hometown of Gath Heifer was part of that. So was Jonah under Assyrian and grew up under Assyrian captivity and rule and reign? Quite possible. As a vassal state, Israel was a vassal state of the Assyrian Empire. And then they came back and they went to war and they took some of their land back. And you saw the empire shrink. We looked at that. So could that be the reason? Jonah has some deep-seated, I'm positive. What I think we see here is that Jonah doesn't like the Assyrians. I don't think we can make that a universal statement to all Gentiles. Because the text says that he said, throw me over, and your troubles go away. The storm is here on my account. Instead of, we're all going to go down together. I, yeah, well, well, I'm thinking along that they were the, the Syrians were enemies all along before. They've always been a threat to... to, uh, to always. <laughs> so, he's, uh, so he, I can understand why he feels that way towards them, you know. Like, why should they get mercy from God? You know, that's not... There is that thought. Like, you know, there, there, is, there is that thought. You know, There's that thought of also on the same line, if they're allies with God, how much against the chosen people of God can they be? Yeah. Except we have to follow this in its 8th century context. And the nation of Israel in Hosea, just a few years after the writing of Jonah and the events of Jonah occur, God is going to tell the nation of Israel, you are not my priests. One second, I'll get to you. The significance of that comment is he's not talking about those we would call priests. As we looked back in the in Exodus, when God calls him out and crosses over the Red Sea, the giving the day before the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, God says to Moses, you are to tell them that this nation, the nation of Israel, the entire nation of Israel that just came out of captivity, you are to be my priests to the world. So when Hosea says, you are not my priest, he is not talking about the Levitical system because in northern Israel, the Levites were not the priests. When he says, you are not my priest, he's saying, you're not my people. And that just goes with lower on my and low am not my people and not love. Go ahead, Tom. Reading this today in, in, in this day and age, you know, what I think about is, you know, it just reminds me that our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Totally. You know, I mean, Jonah is reacting as a human, you know, to the situation that involves him and he's thinking himself thinking about the things, how it affects him, how it affects him personally, you know, all the way down the line, he's thinking about his past. He's not thinking the way God does, obviously. Totally. God has a plan. He is going to do this. And if he wants to spare the Ninevites for whatever reason, he's God, I'm not. Yeah. And that's what I need to 
remember about every situation that I read. Absolutely. On that same note, we don't have time to do this. I was hoping to finish where we are now, like three weeks ago, and have this time to look at this. Because you look at the book of Habakkuk. Does anybody remember Habakkuk? All right. So it's a very interesting book. It's a great book. It's a dialogue between a prophet and God. Habakkuk starts off and saying, God, look at this. This is violence. Hamas. Look at this. What's going on? And God says, don't worry. I'm preparing somebody to take, take care of this. You jump in again. Well, I'm preparing somebody to take care of that. That would be the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. And he comes back and says, God, these people are worse than what was going on at home to begin with. This is the nation of Judah. This is after the events of 722, after the 10 northern tribes are gone. And God says, just relax. I got this. So this table blade's not locked. <laughs> it was like that the other day. I should have looked before class. I'm sorry. We've had one of those claps. It just, you know, you look over and you see it. You're like, all right, now I'm going to check them all. Um, it's easy to clip them with your foot, you know, if you yeah. raise your leg or whatever. But in Habakkuk, how does he answer? The righteous will live by his faithfulness words that we see Paul re-quoting several times. And then he writes this great, beautiful song, chapter 3 of Habakkuk, where he says, God, I don't understand it. Nothing is right. There's no food. There's no nothing. Yet I trust you. Jonah's angry. Jonah is angry to the point where he'd rather die. Remember, this storm throw me in. I'm drowning. Everything's encompassing me. Lord, save me. I want to die. Nineveh has been rescued or will be rescued. And I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be around that. I don't want to live in a world where that's true. That's Joan. Then the Lord said, you had compassion for a plant, but you had nothing to do with it. Nothing at all. Do you have a right to have compassion for the plant? What's Jonah's answer? Of course I do. Of course I do. The idea of the, the argument from the lesser to greater, there's actually a Latin phrase for that. You know, there's a lot in that. Latin phrases, and if I was really smart and wanted you to make that, I think I was really smart, I'd have remembered it, or I would have written it down to tell you, but I, my Latin's really, really bad. That's worse than my English. Mm -hmm. Good. Some of you got the joke. My English isn't all that great. You know? <laughs> the argument here is, is, if you can have compassion for a plant, why can't I, which you did nothing for, why can't I have compassion for my children? And he says, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120 persons who don't know the difference between their right hand and their left hand? Now, this phrase has sparked a lot of debate. What exactly does it mean? There are a couple of different ways people have understood this. And, you know, honestly, if we wanted to spend the time looking through historical scholarship, it's really interesting to watch the turns and the tides. Because you go way back, and this meant children. 120,000 persons meant children, that they don't know the difference between the right and their left, all right? Children of varying ages and all that, which would have put the population of Nineveh somewhere around 600,000 people, right? Scholarship moving up into the, let's say, mid-19th century, up until pretty recent, all right, would say that that couldn't have been that, the city couldn't have been that big. It couldn't have sustained that many people. That would have been very large for a city of that a population for a city of that size during that time in history, right? And as we talked about before, when we were talking about the three days journey and walking around the city, we have writings of Sennacherib, how he expanded the wall, the city wall around Assyria, or around uh, Nineveh. So we have a good idea as to what the city proper was, but this could have been talking about the outskirts of the city as well, all right? 
But in this, all right, scholarship said that was way too big. So this couldn't be referring to children. This had to be the people who were just, you know, anywhere from children, but including adults and all of that, that were not spiritually discerned. All right. They didn't know good from bad. That's kind of what their thought was. The interesting side of it is, is um, I, I, you know, even towards the end, I, I, it doesn't really matter, but there was a commentary that was put out in 2023. Okay. It was published in 2023 by Anchor Bible Commentary. All right. That is a scholarly commentary series that is on the liberal side. All right. So when I say liberal, I mean that they're going to go in all sorts of different directions and all that. And they rewrote the one that they had. Um, I was 20 years ago or so, something like that. I don't remember. I had them both. But um, what was interesting is in 2023, they said that, yeah, that was probably kids. And that the city was that big. And the city could have supported that. It's interesting. So that's just to show you that we don't really know what it means. And even a critical scholar, scholars, there was four people who wrote that one. They don't even know exactly what it means. So pick whatever you want. The reality is, is we're talking about 120,000 image bearers, plus other people who might be able to distinguish the right hand from the left, whatever that phrase meant. We're talking like a whole lot of people versus one plant. I mean, that's the greater, the lesser, right? The plant and people. Jodan's answer? Silence. Oh, and by the way, you don't care about the people. What about the animals? You care about the animals. Now, don't take this to mean that God is making a point about animals. Because there are those who read this into the text. If you want to talk about God's view on animals, this is not the place you're going to go. <clears throat> but it fits into the argument, does it not? What does Jesus say about the animals? You don't have to know. We'll go there. But if you want to say it out, before I get down and scroll down to put the little link to bring us there. All right, nobody did. Matthew chapter 10, verse 20 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? A very, very small amount of money, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. How much more are you? Greater or lesser? Greater. It's not new. It's not the first time that happened. We can see it all the way back here. It's actually, you know, pretty common throughout a lot of things. So God cares. Absolutely. But he cares a lot more about the people. That's the argument. And Jonah does not. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? The great city in which there are no more than under or are more than 120 persons who do not know the difference between the right hand and the left, as well as many animals. All right, that's Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> or let's just say there's a lot of people who were not around for the very first day of class. <clears throat> God spoke to Jonah and he said, go, go, go. But Jonah didn't listen. He said, no. Jonah ran and tried to hide. He found a ship and went inside. But God sent a, wind, a stormy wind outside to blow, blow, blow. Jonah told the sailors, you should throw, throw, throw. Throw me out. And then the storm will go, go, go. But swimming in the deep blue sea, a fish was waiting hungrily. It swallowed Jonah easily. Jonah prayed inside the fish, so, so sad. He said, God, I'm sorry, I was so, so bad. He didn't say that. <laughs> and, Jonah, and the fish threw Jonah on the sand, and Jonah heard the Lord's command, go and preach in other lands. Go, go, go. And Jonah said, can you guess? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you see the little picture of him carrying a scroll and happy? Okay. <laughs> Jonah happy when he went? <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Well played. <laughs> but the book of John. We started off with two questions. They've been answered. We answered them a couple weeks ago. 
Why is the book of Jonah in the Bible? And then why Nineveh? Two separate questions. Why is the book of Jonah in the Bible? Well, as I said, I believe it was written at the same time of the book of Kings. The book of First and Second Kings was written to explain why Israel, what was left of Israel, Judah, was in the Babylonian captivity. Because when you look and read through the book of Kings, you see how the kingdom reacted to the covenant and how they violated the covenant time and time and time again. You have many of your minor prophets, which are giving the commentary on the events that happened during this time. Jonah is different from that. Jonah doesn't read. The book of Jonah does not read like any other prophetic book, although it's closest inside of the uh, book of the 12, right? The 12 minor prophets, we call them. But there's no prophecy. There's no numbers. I also believe that the book of Jonah was written because to show us God's uh, mercy when someone repents. You know, because uh, Syria is you never know, you know, polluted with the Bible. And they were, you know, well, we see, we see that very thing throughout the entire Bible. Yeah, and yeah, and then how you call it? And, and, uh, and, and yes, they repent, you know, and God, you know, his wrath subsided for that moment. But after 100 years, they went back. That's, they weren't the same people. The, All the people in the time of Jonah were dead yes. by the time they get carried off into Syria. Isaiah. You need to go to Isaiah and read it. Because once again, the, the similarities between the Assyrians being used and the Babylonians being used, not only is there similarities in the book of Jonah, the book of Amos to explain it, as well as Jonah to the book of Habakkuk, but you've also got Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, and you've got Isaiah chapter 10 dealing with the Assyrians. Both of God's chosen tools chosen implements, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and God said, I got you, and I'm going to deal with it. He also said the same thing inside. So yes, we've got it. There's, there's so many parallels that we can't talk about, but to the point, if the Bible says it earlier and more clearly than it does here, that can't be the purpose of the book. You can see that totally. You can totally see God's character in this book. And we're going to talk about some of those things we see about it, but that's not why it's there. That can't be why it's there. Because when we just talked about God's compassion, we see that in Exodus. When after the golden calf, which is, by the way, compassion, when the fact that God did not wipe them all out, that's compassion. Moses says, show me your ways that I may know you. And we have what we were just read in verse 2, I think it is. For I knew that you were compassionate God, so to him, by the loving kindness. Relenting of the calamity, right? We see that. It's taught all the way back, you know, 700 years earlier. So to say that's the reason, I can't see that. That can't be the reason. It's stated other places. But as I said, we see the difference between how Nineveh acts, because we looked at that as well, how the difference between Nineveh, going back into Amos, and how the Israelites acted. We saw, we talked about how verses, whichever they are, where it talks about the people, and then you've got the king's decree, the next verse down, why are both of those there? Only one of those are needed in the book. But you see a direct correlation into Amos when the land cannot handle these words of the prophet. That was the northern Israel. The correlations and the strike, they're, they're there. We just don't have the time to spend it out. So I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version. So we've got, got an understanding of it to move forward with the next part of class, which is what we wanted to do earlier. Before we can talk about what it means to us today, we have to understand what it meant then, because if it didn't mean it then, it cannot mean it today. So the next question is, is we're answering is, why Nineveh? And that is clearly stated in Amos, but not clearly stated. It's clearly stated why the Babylonians in Habakkuk. However, in Amos chapter six, I think it's verse 14, he states that I am preparing a nation to take you out. That is the premise before chapter 7 where he says the land can't handle this information. The land can't handle this, all right? But he's preparing the nation. We know that nation is Assyria. So why Jonah? Why did they need to repent? Well, maybe because they were just too bad. I don't know. They weren't able to be used by God at that time for his purpose because of what they were doing? I, I don't know, but we do know that God says, I'm preparing a nation and I sent a prophet to you. This is not the only time we've seen this, by the way. If you remember that guy named Elijah, 
right? The first guy, the guy on Mount Carmel, he gets upset after Carmel. He runs to the desert. God says, why are you here? He says, I just want to die. I'm the only one. And God says, I got a mission for you. You need to go out and do a few more things. One of those things he did, it's a very little footnote in this whole thing, is he goes and anoints a king of Aram. It's a foreign nation. We'll go follow in through the book of Kings and find out what Aram does. Because those were people that God used to whittle away the kingdom of Israel. God has done this throughout time. Why Nineveh? He was preparing Nineveh. God has prepared other kingdoms. It explicitly states that, that he anointed a king of another nation. And it also explicitly says that he was preparing the Chaldeans for their job that they were going to do for executing his vengeance. In, in fact, we should just probably go there. <clears throat> Something I think that's interesting is that it never says anywhere that, that Jonah repented. He never did. We never know. We don't know that. We don't no, know. We, we're pretty story. confident. We're pretty confident that Later repentance on. is not just action, right? But repentance is also his place of heart. He never said, "God, you're right." Yeah. He never once said anything like that. Right. So Jonah did not. We, we did cover that because there's. It's. It's, yeah. it's. I think it's pretty clear. All right. So Isaiah. The Assyrians. I did. Jesus makes it very clear that the men of Assyria repented. And that's, I think this is all part of it, showing the difference as to why we're here and why we're not. We know the Assyrians repented Every because day Jesus day. makes it very clear the Assyrians repented. He makes it very clear. Exact same thing. That just, goes, that just goes to show your status is not the next person's status. Yep. Absolutely. Your feeling in your heart, granted, can influence your children's heart, but it doesn't count for them. Like right. America. Same way from your parents and generation to generation to generation to generation. So you, we should never make the mistake of thinking because God later takes out the Assyrians, that makes it, they're, they're a different group of people. Jesus says that in that day, the men of Assyria, as well as the queen from the south, if I remember correct, are going to stand in judgment of this generation, the generation Jesus was addressing because they repented at the preaching of Nineveh. Mm -hmm. And one greater than Jonah is here. So, reason. Now, Isaiah chapter 5. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. Right? The Assyrians were God's chosen implement. I'm preparing a nation. Now that we've spent more time on that than was planned, what do we see about God? In the book of Jonah, what do we see about God, the nature of God? And we're going to try to do this quick because I want to ask the same question about Jonah because we need to draw this back into discipleship and we've got like, you know, 10 minutes. Patient. Patient, 100%. He didn't kill Jonah, did he? He didn't. He could have. What else do we see? Well, he says that he's compassionate. Absolutely. Do we see that actually displayed? It's not just words. It's done in action. Don't tell me, show me. We did both. Good. What else do we see? He uses people that we probably wouldn't. Excellent. I didn't hear you. I said he uses people that we probably wouldn't. Ah, uh, 100%. Yep. What else do we see? Is they're all great. I've got many chances. <laughs> That's right. Amen. <laughs> Personally, I'm glad. <laughs> I don't think if he was the God of one shot and <laughs> you're out, <laughs> I'd be here right now. In fact, I know I would. And that's not just because of silly things I did as a child. That's because of the way I lived my life was not in accordance to his will. He had every right to end my life earlier, but he didn't. What else? He's not a God of chaos. He is a God of order. I like that. He has a plan. He has a plan. There's a reason. What's not under God's control? This book, as we said, shows a lot of things. It shows repeatedly how things react to God. What part of his creation is not under his direct control? None. 
Here's a question for you. What else do we see that would almost put that statement in contradiction? It's one we don't think about much, but it's blatant. As soon as I say it, you're like, well, yeah. Free will? Yeah. Do we not see free will being exercised right here? Mm -hmm. The sailors, starting with the sailors, they knew that they needed to throw Jonah over. They did something different. And then finally went to it. Jonah knew he was supposed to go to Nineveh. I should say, we started first with Nineveh, right? God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, and he said, no, I'm not going to. We've got the sailors. Then we've got Jonah once again going to Nineveh, but still not even doing the full, complete job and being upset about it. We've got the Assyrians who actually repent. We got a lot of free will being shown here. Never once did God tell Jonah, I'm going to change your heart, and you're going to do it, and you're going to do it with a smile. It's interesting. Now, what do we see about Jonah? Fear. Fear. I think we, I think if you're going to say free will, obviously that's in the book, but God gets his, is going to get his way anyway. Jonah went the wrong way. He went and got him and took him and said, no, this is what we're going to do. Well, let me ask you this. Did Jonah have the right to refuse that still? And the reason I ask you this is, did he have to pray out inside of the water as he's drowned? Was that a force? No, it was his choice. Oh, but that fish got his attention. <laughs> Humanity. After he was drowning. Right. Keep in mind, he's sinking in this water. People did not know how to swim as often as much as they do now. Gath Heifer's landlocked. So the idea that he could have been on this boat that was going to Tarsus, which is a far way away, and where a fish is swimming around big enough to swallow him, he's not going to make it back. Right? That, there, there could not be any way in his mind or the mind of that crew that by throwing him in the water, he was going to live past that point. You know, also, given all the history of everything that you go back and, you know, I don't know all that stuff. But what I take out of this is, is kind of, <clears throat> I mean, all the kids know the story of Jonah. They don't know all, all these slides. They know the story. And what's the story that, that they, I mean, I like I, I liked that story because he, he does what we do, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I got somebody at work that does me wrong. I want him to pay the price for it. He gets away with it and it makes me mad. Mm -hmm. That's Jonah. That's true. <laughs> That's what I get from that book. Yeah, I think it's I think it's laid out clearly. The heart of Jonah is not right. And if we would heart of Jonah is not a disciple part of discipleship. No, but if there was a book that was being written and somebody did me wrong and I said, let's go get him. I hope you get him. You should get him. And he gets a promotion. I, and I get mad about it. What you know, so, sooner or later there's something I'm gonna learn from. See, we would hope so. And, and this is why we can't place Jonah too far in time, because we don't know when that prophecy and the acknowledgement in 2 Kings chapter 14 comes where God fully owns Jonah. Was it before or after the events? We don't know. So we, we just don't know that. But now I want you to say something here. I want you to acknowledge your statement, and how it fits into the book of Habakkuk. I told you I didn't know all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Habakkuk cries out to God, this isn't fair, this isn't right. God said, just wait and see. And then he comes back and said, God, I see this, and this isn't right. But we don't think about that when we get mad. Yeah, but we should. I know. Because the righteous live by his faithfulness. In context, that's what that passage means. That the righteous are going to live off the promises of God. God says, don't worry, Steve. I got this. And Jonah says, I don't like it. <laughs> Another comment on Jonah. He's Peter. He's human. <laughs> yes. Thus. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everyday man. See, people like to talk about proofs, and I use the term loosely for proofs for the Bible and all that. If you're going to write this fantastic story, why would this be in here? To show you how men are. <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't really bode. And if you read other ancient texts where they're religious in nature and all that, look and see how people like this shit. I eat. I don't want to speak too much out of turn here. But there's another 
religion where you're going to come. It does not go by Jonah. He goes by another name, but it's the story of Jonah. All right, another major world religion. It reads very different. Are you aware of that? So have you ever read him in the Quran? Why are you books that mean they're talking about the, the, the specific no, no. nation? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I got you, sister. We totally own you and embrace you, but you probably know more about the Quran than I do. But I did read. That's oh, you didn't. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. Sorry. Jonah's in the Quran, by the way, and he reads very different. Jonah is in the Quran. Jonah, the story of Jonah, as with many other Bible stories, many characters, is in the Quran. I'm sorry. I thought you knew. I, I apologize. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to throw it. Okay. You're not the only one. <laughs> So we didn't bring it up until this point, but Jonah's in the Quran. But when you read the accounts of Jonah in the Quran, just like when you read the accounts of Adam or you read the accounts of Moses or any of those other the accounts of Jesus, they're very different. They read how we would want them to read. Right? This doesn't. Now I'm going to go back and read it. <laughs> There's several different it spots up. where it shows up. It's not, it's not all in one different place. So he's mentioned like five or six different places in there. So, um, yeah. All right, but on that note, Interesting. questions? We are at that time where they're gonna say, why aren't you done? Go ahead. Quick question. Absolutely. So you said uh, earlier that the Assyrians repented and then uh, 100 years later they were destroyed, but it was a different generation. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. I know at one point in the Bible it says that humans lived like a long time, like much longer than mm -hmm. we do now. Would that have been at that time? That would have been after that. That, that was long since past the times of these 100 plus year lives. Now, now to keep in mind, you've got 120,000. If this means 120,000 children, it is quite possible. That's them telling us we're supposed to. <laughs> I, want to I want to follow this thought out real quick because it's actually important. We need to understand that there are a few very key stories that are in the Bible, and a lot of times we don't realize why they're there. One of them would be in the story of Sodom. Abraham comes up and has an argument with God, a discussion about God is if there's X amount of people, would you not destroy this city? Okay. But all this way down to 10, God says, if there's 10 people, I will not destroy the city. There was three righteous people in the city and he got all three of them out and then he destroyed the city. The guilty don't get punished with the innocent and the innocent don't get punished with the guilty. So we need to keep that in mind. That's our God. That's interesting. I've never heard that before. <laughs> Well, ask yourself, why is the dialogue between Abraham and God in the Bible? It doesn't need to be there. We understand thought and God destroyed, but the dialogue between God and Abraham does not need to be in the Bible. It could be taken out and you wouldn't miss anything huge, except when you see the reality. God said, you're innocent, you go. Look at 2 Peter, or 1 Peter, whichever it is, where he talks about righteous Lot being upset about the things he saw. We know how Lot, that, that story ends with Lot and his daughters. If you don't know, go read it. I'm not going to rehash that because they'll really get upset with me. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality is, is God doesn't punish the innocent. He lets each man die for his own sin. He actually says that in the law. All right? There are other things that will seem like apparent contradictions, and if you know those, you can come up and talk to me. We can talk about that and work through that. But the reality is, is God's not going to hold somebody accountable for something they didn't do. So when Jesus said the men of Nineveh are going to stand up in judgment at this day, those, weren't the, those were the men of Nineveh that repented. The men that were destroyed 100 plus years, whatever it is, 100 or so years, six, I, I don't know, 622, it's jumping there, six something in the 20s jumps out, I don't remember exactly, sorry. That's when the Babylonians come in and take over Assyria and destroy Assyria as a nation. That doesn't mean that all Assyrians die. Just as a world power. Go ahead. Sorry, so the Assyrians are a nation, not a country. Um, all right, so so think about um, in modern day, more modern day times, you've got you you've got like we have the United States and we own Puerto Rico, but Puerto Rico is not a full state, it's a vassal state. That would be the same kind of idea as a colony. Thank you. Could, the word was escaping me. Absolutely. That's what I was looking for was a colony. But you think about how, how a history was. So you've got the main country, the main continent or whatever, that ruling authority exerting authority over other areas, right? So they're not sovereign. 
Yeah, so they don't, they're not necessarily a sovereign territory of their own. They may have their own form of government, but they had some people who were over the top. Same of form of government. The United yeah. States. Just a colony of the United States. Yeah, so you know, so you've got but you've got that that, that same idea. So there's an overarching authority and you still have local government. That's the difference. Yes. On that note, let's pray. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we say thank you. We thank you for your patience. We thank you that you are a loving God. We thank you that you sent Jesus Christ down to this earth to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, so that we can have a right relationship with you, Father. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. 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 Thank